How's it going, Can Crushers? Welcome to another episode of the Crushing Cans Podcast Pick'em Show. Tonight, we're going to talk about UFC Fight Night, Derek Lewis, Lewis versus Alexi Olianik. Hey, let's jump into our picks. Let's do it. Hey, before we do that, we want to remind you guys to make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Comment on this video. Let us know what you think about the picks. Make sure you subscribe to our page. Talk to your friends. Share about yeah, Share yeah, us. Buddy. Yeah. Let's get it. Join right. our Tapology League. Tapology.com slash group slash 434. Or yeah. just uh, search us, Crushing Cans Podcast, on uh, Tapology.com. Yeah, man. Join the group. We, we, we want to add more people every time. We want to compete with you. So join us. Compete with us. Try to beat us. All right. So let's jump into the card. The first fight of the night is Irwin the Beast Rivera versus Ali, the royal fighter, Al Chiesi. This is at 135 pounds. Uh, Irwin Rivera, he's coming out of Mexico. He's 9-5 and five overall. He's 31 years old. He's 5 feet 6 inches tall, and he's 0-1 in the UFC uh, with the loss to Giga Chikazi. Um, but he did go up to fight up a weight class, and it was on 24 hours notice in that fight. Yep. So uh, that is notable. He's fighting uh, Ali al <coughs> um, who is fighting out of Jordan. He's 8-3. and three. He's 29 years old. He's five feet eight inches tall, and he's making his UFC debut. Tell me what you think about these guys. This is going to be a, a fun fight for me. Yeah. I think, you know, we're starting to cut off with a bang right here. Um, you know, with we saw Rivera versus the Chikadze fight that you yep. were just talking about. He looked explosive. I mean, he was throwing Superman punches left and right, um, jumping over some of Chikadze's kicks. He was just all going crazy in there. Yeah. The uh, the only problem I think that he ran into is he just ran into a much bigger yeah. Chikadze. You know, yeah. he, he usually fights at 135. So yep. Usually fights at 135. Like we said, he took the fight on 24 hours notice. He went to a decision. Um, he was explosive and all that stuff, like, like you were talking about. The size was the biggest factor in that fight. Mm -hmm. And this was the biggest factor I saw overall when I was looking at Rivera's fights is uh, he's typically the shorter fighter. But he's a little bit stockier. Mm -hmm. On his profile, it says five feet six inches tall. I kind of question that just because of the way he looks standing next to the other fighters. But like you pointed out when we were talking just amongst ourselves, he's been fighting tall guys a lot of the times too. So it's not like they're short guys that he's fighting. Right. So um, you know, talking about him, it's a little bit it's a little bit different as far as what what is his real body structure like. We'll see he'll be up against some real 135 pounders. Um, but he is the former Titan FC 135 pound champion. Mm -hmm. uh, he has five knockouts to his record, and he has three decisions and one submission. So he's well versed. He's he's got a lot of experience. Uh, this Al Chiesi guy though, man, I get excited when I watch him fight. He is a bull, man. Yeah. So Al Chiesi's a, a he's a kind of a weird one. You know he, he likes to go for the guillotine a lot. A lot. A lot, and he gets it from standing in the clinch, mm -hmm. which is crazy. And he's just got such a strong grip that when he gets you, you're not getting out. Yeah, so his, uh, um, <laughs> you know, that's his, his game. He's going to get in, he's going to tie up with you, and he's going to use, like, that strength that we talked about because mm -hmm. he is super strong, and he'll grab a hold of your head, and he's just going to hold on to it and squeeze and try to pop that thing right off. Yep. And he squeezes so tight. Uh, but it is his UFC debut. So that is important. We, we've talked about uh, the octagon jitters and stuff like that, um, how those debuts can affect you. And, uh, you know, so that, that could play a factor into it. But he is currently on a five-fight win streak. Mm -hmm. So he's on a five-fight win streak. He has four submissions. Most of those are by guillotine. Um, he has three decision wins. So he can go the distance, even with the pace that he pushes and the, and the amount of force that he's trying to put into everything. Like it, it's still pretty incredible that he can go 15 minutes doing things the way that he's doing it because your muscles tire out fast when you fight the way he fight, fights. He's a pretty muscular guy too, and he, yeah, he's so he's going to be looking to get this to the ground though. Um, I just don't know that he's going to actually be able to keep Rivera on the ground if he does get him down. Rivera's, Rivera's super explosive and he's wily and just really hard to get a hold of. Yeah. So good luck actually getting him in the clinch in order to get him down. Because I didn't really see a shot no. from, uh, from Al Casey. From Al Casey. No. I, I did see, you know, he, he prefers to clinch takedowns, get you down, drag you down, and then just try to yeah, take you Yeah, I mean, he's going to try to close so. the distance. You know, he, he, he has a little bit of striking, but his game is definitely close the distance, tie up with you, 
start squeezing on you. Yeah. And so that's what we're looking for on that one. Um, ultimately, though, watching those fights with Al Chiesi, I was really excited. And uh, I'm taking a shot in the dark right here. I would say, you know, he's probably the underdog in this fight right here. But I'm going with him to win by decision. Okay. See, I don't, I don't think he has enough tools standing up to hang with Rivera on the feet. And I think Rivera is going to be able to use his explosiveness, his speed to get in, land the shots, um, just pepper him. Eventually, you know, he's going to get that decision win. So, I mean, we both think it's going to be a decision. Opposite fighters. All right. Well, we'll so. see what happens. So they both, it's worth noting as well, they both only have three decision wins. So, you know, if it does end up going to decision, both guys are, are capable of winning a decision. There's not like there's a real marketable advantage there for them, but that, that's going to be an interesting fight. Yeah, I, think, I like it. I think, think it's starting with the banger. <laughs> yeah, if it goes to the ground, I think you're going to see that Al Casey has the advantage. Yeah. And if he's able to keep it there, and uh, that's his path to victory. But I think Rivera's path to victory is a little, little, little bit easier since the fight starts standing up. You have to try to get him you down. Have to try to, yeah. So I think Rivera's going to do enough to keep the fight standing and uh, just win that decision. That's a fair point. So. I mean, well, we'll find out, you know. That's why they fight. We can make predictions, but they fight so we can find out. Bingo. And it was a tough card to pick overall. Just overall. letting you guys go know. <laughs> this one, last week's card was just a shit show. Um, I don't know anybody on YouTube that we've watched that has made that, that picked that one really well. We watched some other channels and... Just about everybody well, struggled on that card. I mean, you got to think. I only had uh, the, the, the 11 fight card. It was originally supposed to be a 13 fight card when they were booking it early on. It changed to an 11 fight card because of the issues that they were having with some of the fighters. Uh, then it changed down to a, a, a 10 fight card. And then it dropped down to, on the day of, an 8 fight card. Yeah. So over and over and over again, like that card just kept getting messed, up, messed with. And I only got... Uh, 50% of them correct. I got yeah. four correct, but out of the 3,045 people that picked, I finished like 289th or something like that. Yeah, was, I might be a little bit off, but you know, nobody really picked that card super well. Yeah, that, that card was just crazy, but I think this one, in terms of actually picking the fights, I think it was harder to pick this oh, card. Oh, man. This, this, fight was des this fight card right here, on paper, is designed to be a super exciting, fan-friendly card. Like this is this is awesome. When you have a a, a a fight card where there's really not a title fight or like a title shot implication on the line, they just really stacked it from top to bottom with a lot of exciting fighters. No. Yeah. So this should be awesome. Uh, but then we move on mm -hmm. to the next one here. This one was Yusuf the Moroccan Devil Zalal versus Peter Slippery Pete Barrett at 145 pounds. This is another one I'm super <coughs> excited about. Um, I actually have this one pinned to be a potential fight of the night. This is going to be, be a super exciting fight with Yusuf Zalal fighting out of Morocco, hence the nickname the Moroccan Devil. Um, he's 9-2 overall in MMA. He's a really young guy at 23 years old. He's 5 feet 10 inches tall, and he's 2-0 and in the UFC with both wins coming by decision over Jordan Griffin and uh, Austin Lingo. Mm -hmm. um, and right now he's currently on a three-fight win streak. Uh, he goes against Peter Barrett. Peter Barrett's an American. He's 11 and three. He's 33 years old. He's five feet nine inches tall. And his last fight was on Dana White's Contender Series, um, and he won that fight uh, by decision, if I remember. So, uh, what do you think about these guys? Well, you know, last time we saw Zalal actually wasn't too long ago. It was against, you know, I think you already shouted out his name there, um, Jordan Griffin. Yep. Yep. Um, you know, I think in that one. We didn't do a pick em show for that card, but we did make picks, and I'm pretty sure we both picked Griffin to win that one by submission. Yeah. And Zalal proved us wrong. Yeah, I'm pretty much off the Griffin train at this point right now. Yeah. Um, I tried to, to, to jump on it, given his credentials and stuff, but I'm off of it right now. Uh, Zalal proved himself to be the better fighter in that fight for sure. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, Zalal's a BJJ black belt, mm -hmm. and uh, he's also a very good kickboxer. So, he, he's pretty much good everywhere and he showed us that yeah in several of his fights if you look yeah. at the uh the jose marisol fight or Mar mariscal I, I don't know how to pronounce his name um he actually was able to get takedowns of his own and showed he's got a good top game too so yeah. instead of just defending a lot like he did in the griffin fight um he was actually putting on an offensive ground game yeah well i mean so, he's gonna he does have an offensive ground game too yeah right being a BJJ so black belt. being a bjj black belt he has the five submission wins to his record that's how most of his wins come by um he has two knockouts and he has two decisions 
So going to the ground, that could potentially be an advantage for him. And Peter Barrett's got pretty good wrestling, though. He does so, a good wrestling. So um, there's, there's a chance that it will go to the ground. We'll find out what happens there. Uh, Peter Barrett, like we said, 33 years old. He has seven knockouts right now. He has two submissions of his own and two decisions. Um, he's going to look to keep it on the feet. This is gonna t- this is gonna turn out to be I think you know you're looking at a striker striker versus grappler. Peter Barrett has the striking, but his advantage is gonna be on the feet. Um, what do you think's gonna end up happening here? I don't necessarily agree that his advantage is on the feet. I mean I think that's probably his. I don't know because it's hard you know with wrestlers in their ground game. Sometimes they're better than black belt uh, jujitsu guys, and sometimes those jujitsu guys are just leagues above them. Especially well, you know, a jiu-jitsu guy with wrestling. It's it's kind of it's kind of <laughs> like you get a you get a wrestler out there against a jiu-jitsu guy, he's gonna lose most of the time. But mm-hmm. you get a wrestler who knows a little bit about jiu-jitsu and has a good understanding of what's going on with jiu-jitsu. Mm-hmm. That's gonna change around a little bit. Yeah. You know, you're gonna have these guys come out and be able to pull out some some wins of their own by by being able to just simply shut down the jiu-jitsu game. Um, but you know, if you look at what Peter Peter likes to do, his striking is fun. Yeah, he's he's kind of wild though. I mean, he rushes forward a lot and just wings his punches out yeah. there. It leaves himself open to get hit though. Yeah, he does um, do that. But it makes it exciting for the fans. Yeah. Now, if we're talking like we said, fan friendly card. We we we've been know. telling you this is going to be a fan friendly card. Uh, I noticed that in his uh, other fights, he's pretty strong in the clinch too. Like mm-hmm. he'll get you up against the cage. So if he doesn't, if he even gets his Alal in a position where he's trying to grapple with him. I think a lot of the grappling in this fight is going to be up against the cage, against in, the cl- the cage. in the clinch. Yeah, I, I mean, and that's pretty much where I see it happening. I think that Barrett's going to be able to stop it from going to the ground, um, which is why I think the striking is going to be his advantage. There's a lot of kickboxer, Zalal's too, though. got decent striking, but you look at where he, where he finishes it. You know, he's got five, he's got five submissions versus uh, Barrett's seven knockouts. So, you know, if it goes to the ground, based on what they've done in their, in their past performances as fighters, you know, Zalal has the edge on the ground. And if it goes to the feet, Zalal has kickboxing, but Peter Barrett's the one who's shown he can put people away. Yeah, I don't know. It's just, uh, it's going to be a wild, wild fight, man. Yeah. I just think that Zalal's kickboxing is actually more technical and better than what Barrett has on the feet. Yeah. Um, Barrett's really wild. Zalal being a more technical guy, I think he's going to be able to hit Barrett a few times. So I think Barrett's going to turn into a wrestler. He's going to go to his wrestling roots in this fight. Um, but ultimately, I think Zalal is going to actually uh, win this one with a submission in round two. I like this so far. So the last fight card, we had a lot of the same picks. And the one before that. And the one before that. And this one here, we're coming right out the gate. We both got two separate picks uh, right out the gate. I think P- Peter Barrett's going to knock him out in the third round. I think that you're going to have an interesting fight the first couple of rounds. It's going to be a close fight. Uh, there is going to be the grappling. I think that uh, Peter Barrett, though, he's a little bit lighter on his feet. And I think that he's going to be able to outstrike uh, Yusuf Zalal going into the long run. I think hitting round three puts him away. But we'll find out what happens. So I got Barrett knockout round three. You have Zalal by decision submission, or submission. Submission round two. Submission round two. Well, we'll see what happens there. Right out the gate, two or 0-2. Oh we don't have anything to say. Uh, the same right now. This next fight, I'm super excited about this fight as well. So this next fight, this is Gavin Tucker. This is Gavin the Governor Tucker versus <coughs> Justin Guitar Hero James. Um, Justin Justin James made his UFC debut a couple months ago, and in this UFC debut, he comes in on short notice and he comes out just ready to fire. The bell the the bell goes off and he comes forward just starts throwing crazy punches. And, uh, you know, he was able to knock his dude out. And that, I, I was super excited about watching that. Just the way that he fights is super action-packed, action super fast-paced. And it's proven over and over again by lots of first-round finishes. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Gavin Tucker's no slouch. Gavin Tucker's a beast, dude. Yeah. This so. was So, again, another fight that was so hard to pick. Yeah. Like, these guys, man, they just... The UFC made it really, really hard on Vegas for this card, I think. Yeah. Because this one is just well, they, a they, hard they one wanted to, pick. to uh, take care of the fans, right? So. Gavin Tucker, he's Canadian. He's 11 and 1. He's 34 years old. He's 5 feet 6 inches tall, and he's 2 and 1 in the UFC. Um, he's coming off of a submission win in late 2019. Um, and then uh, he also has a decision win over Sam Cecilia in his UFC debut. Justin James, like we said, he's 1-0 in the UFC with that knockout. He's an American. He's 16-4, and and he's 
currently on a five fight win streak all of them coming by first round knockouts or uh, first round finish sorry there's been some uh, submissions in there as well what do you think about these guys I you know like I said it's going to be a hard fight to pick every single one of these fights so far have just been ridiculously yeah. difficult um, for me you know you said Tucker he's fighting for the fourth time in UFC he's a BJJ black belt too yep. Yep. Um, he has some really solid striking though, so he's really well he, rounded. He, I like the way he strikes. I think that he's the more technical of the two. Strikers. He is. He's very technical. Yeah, he, he has really good, exciting he's strikes. Powerful. And this is what made this this fight like super hard for me to pick. Mm -hmm. I think I actually changed my mind probably more on this fight than any other fight. And what what's funny about this? So you got the Guitar Hero and Justin James mm -hmm. versus uh, Gavin Tucker who is a guitar enthusiast himself. Yeah. He's a, a, a blues musician, and uh, he had a, a ton of, like, really good guitars, and Gavin Tucker was selling those guitars to help pay for his training for MMA so he could do MMA. That's and, an interesting uh, uh, tidbit you found yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting, just, just given the fact that, you know, Justin James, a guitar hero guy, it, it's kind of funny how, I don't know if that, if that played into making the fight or anything, but I just thought it was interesting how... Guitar hero, guitar enthusiast. They put them together in a fight. I thought that, that was kind of fun. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just, just little fun facts out there, right? Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, I mean, overall, like you said, Gavin Tucker is a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt with great striking. Great striking. He's also the former extreme cage combat 145-pound champion. Mm -hmm. um, so he's, he's pretty experienced, and he looks really good. But Justin James, you know, so Justin James... While he's just new to the UFC, he's got a lot of other stuff to his record. So he's the former WXC 155-pound champion, um, former WXC catchweight champion, that's at 150 pounds, um, former total warrior combat 155-pound champion. He did fight in Bellator and the World Series of Fighting, um, and he wrestled in college at 165 pounds. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is going to be an interesting fight. I'm really excited about this one overall. Yeah, it, like I said, it's going to be fun, man. So, I mean, we've already talked a little bit about Gavin Tucker. Yeah. Speak, you just got into Justin James, man. Um, for me, I think everybody saw what James did in his UFC debut on short notice. Yes. I think Gavin Tucker is fully aware of that. Um, I think James is going to want to stand and bang. He wants to brawl. Yeah. Even though he's a wrestler. Mm-hmm. I think uh, well, you're going to see Look Gavin. at what he's been doing. He's yeah. been knocking everybody out, right? So I think that Gavin Tucker going into this fight, their their game plan is likely to avoid that power. Yeah. So I think Tucker's going to be the wrestler here, which means I think that they're going to uh, negate that first. He's got So James has three knockouts in the first round right now. He's got a knockout streak yeah. of three straight yeah. knockout and, finishes and his, in the first his round. His last five fights are all first-round finishes. Well, the, the one so. is an... Uh, Disqualification, disqualification because of fence grabbing. But, yeah, from a fence grab. But, you know, mm -hmm. he had the one submission one outside of that as well. Mm -hmm. So, but even then, it doesn't matter if it's a, because they grabbed the cage or whatever. It's a first round finish on the record. Yeah. First round finish. He was beating somebody so badly they were embarrassed. They grabbed onto a cage and held onto it so bad that they had to disqualify him. Like, how crazy is that? Have you ever heard of somebody actually being disqualified for grabbing the cage? <laughs> right. Like, that's You get crazy. the point deductions and stuff, but yeah. Jesus. Um, but what do you what do you think as far as the, actually I'll tell you who I got right here. So I'm going with Justin James again. Mm -hmm. I'm going with Justin James, another first round knockout. Um, I like what he's doing. He's in your face, and for some reason, when he puts hands on people, like it hurts. Yeah. And uh, he, I didn't think he was the most technical striker, but he seems to find the target and he seems to hit it. He does. And he seems to put people away. And I, I think it only it's only going to take one punch for him to stumble Tucker enough for him to put three or four more powerful shots in there. So I, I, I'm going with the first round knockout again. So I'm yeah. going with Justin James again just because I feel like he has so. that one-touch punch. But so. in 12 fights, James, or Tucker's never been finished. Never. So there is uh, to put that on there. You know, and he, never. You know, he did fight Sam Cecilia, who used to have pretty heavy hands back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I think... Uh, Tucker's going to ruin his first round knockout streak that he's got going. We'll see what happens. Because I think he's going to, I think it's going to be a grappling match for the better part of the first round, round and a half, till they start getting some energy uh, wasted there. And in the second, midway through the second round, 
I think you're going to see it turn into more of a stand-up fight there. And I think right around the first minute, minute and a half of the third round, you're going to see Justin James get another knockout. So we both got Justin James by knockout. We just have different rounds. Different rounds. All right. The next fight is An Andrew Eldirte Sanchez versus Wellington, the prodigy tournament at 185 pounds. Andrew Sanchez, he's an American. He's 11 and 5 overall in MMA. Uh, he's 32 years old. He's 6 feet 1 inches tall, and he's 6 and 3 in the UFC, including his time on Tough Season 23, where he uh, defeated Khalil Roundtree to win the 205 pound tournament. Um, he's coming off a decision loss to Marvin Vittori, but he's going against Wellington Turman from Brazil, and Wellington Turman is 16 and 3, 24 years old, a young guy coming up. Six feet tall and one and one in the UFC. He's coming off a decision win over Marcus Perez. Um, what do you think? You know, another tough fight to pick, guys. We told you this was a hard card. Right, right now, out of the gate, uh, Andrew Sanchez, he's a wrestler. Yep. Um, Four-time All-American. Mm -hmm. Two-time NAIA National Champion out of McKendra University. So... Right away, you know, this guy's a wrestler. Well, and he was also the NAIA uh, Wrestler of the Year as well. Yeah. So, you know, his wrestling credentials are up there. Yeah, his the one something that I noticed about him, though, his striking is just okay. He's yes. still got some work to do on the striking game, but uh, there's always time for improvement. You know, every fight you're trying to get better, right? Um, I don't know how much better we're really going to see. He's 32 years old. Yeah. So I don't know how much better we're going to really see a striking game. He'll probably work on it a little bit, but it's mostly going to be set to set up his game plan. Mm -hmm. And for me, you know, um, that can be taken advantage of. We saw Marvin Vittori do it um, in Sanchez's previous fight, you know. Yeah. Pick, took advantage of him on the feet. Um, so I, I think that clearly Sanchez, he's going to be coming in here and looking to get this fight down. But not so clearly, it's, right? Because uh, <laughs> yeah. you got to go over, and then you got to look at Wellington Terman. Mm -hmm. He's also uh, pretty solid on the ground. Oh yeah, he's a BJJ black belt and has what, some pretty yeah. good wrestling yeah. as well. And he's got seven submissions. Exactly. So you know, if you if you look at the difference here, is Sanchez, you know, Sanchez is looking to either knockout or decision guys typically. Mm -hmm. So he has six knockouts and he has six decisions. He only he only has two submissions. Yep. You know, and a lot of that is is like we were talking about with grinding him out. So a lot of what you see from Sanchez is not necessarily clean knockouts. It's a little bit more of TKO, ground and pound style stuff like that that leads to it. But Wellington Terman, you know, the Brazilian, 16 and three, 24 years old. He's younger. You know, he's six feet tall, one and win one. We said we talked about. Um, you know, he's more comfortable on the ground. He yeah. has that black belt, and he has those seven, those seven submission wins. So this is where it gets interesting. Is Sanchez really going to want to play that ground game with Terman for 15 minutes? Yeah, I don't know that he's going to want to, but I don't but going also know that he's going to gonna be able to stop it. Yeah. So. Well, I don't, know that, I don't know that he wants to stand and bang with him either. No, that's the thing. So. I, I, I think I, I shouted him out on the last card that, or the last uh, podcast we did because um, they were they were showing it up there, and I said, well, it's determined. Keep an eye on that name. That dude's legit. Yeah. He is pretty legit. I think he's, what, 24 years old now, so he's yep. still really young in the game. Super young. Um, you know, I think that this fight is going to go similar uh, to uh, his fight versus Carl Robertson, if you saw that one. It's going to be a little bit of a back-and-forth grappling exchange, you know. Uh, Robertson was able to get him down, get on top a little bit, take control. But Terman was never in any trouble when Robertson was on top. Mm -hmm. When Terman got on top, he actually was working for submissions, uh, ended up taking Robertson's back a couple times, you know, went for some rear nakeds, went for an arm bar, went, went for some crazy things. Well, I man. mean, he, he started getting to that jujitsu game, you yeah. know, and he was attacking. Uh, it, it's interesting to note, though, so if you look at Wellington Terman's last win, it was a decision win over Marcus Perez. Uh, it's a good win. Perez is well, another jiu-jitsu guy. Here's the other thing, though. Sanchez has a win over him as well. Mm -hmm. So they both have a win over him, and that's really the only similar win they have at this point in the UFC. But uh, when I look at Sanchez, he's been in there against the tough, the, the top competition for longer, the tougher competition he for has. longer. He won season, 20, or season 23. Granted, I felt like it was kind of a weaker season, but he did win it. He struggled a little bit in the UFC. Uh, both of their, their best wins are honestly probably the same person in Marcus Perez. Uh, he does have that win, though, over Trevor Smith. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a good win for Andrew Sanchez. This is a close fight, I think. 
But ultimately, I think that Sanchez is going to be able to shut down the jiu-jitsu game. I think he's, he's uh, smart enough to do that. I think he knows enough about jiu-jitsu at this point to shut it down. I think we're going to see him grind out and win a decision. See, I, uh, we're opposite again. Ooh. You want to know why? So for me, real quick, I got to look at this. Sanchez has been knocked out three times in his career, right? Okay. And then if you look at Wellington Terman, he has never been finished. All of his losses are decisions. He has three decision losses. Yes. But I just like Terman a little bit more on the ground. I think he has more tools. So I think you're going to see Terman win this fight by a decision. Well, this is going to be interesting. We'll find out. I'm super excited because we haven't had one the same yet. No. Unlike that uh, card a couple weeks ago, or was it two weeks Last ago? Last couple weeks. <laughs> we, uh, we had 14 out of 15 the same. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> crazy. But, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, that's how close these fights are, though. That is how close this card is right now. Yeah. It's so, so hard to pick them. This next fight, though, um, the, 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 the next fight here, like, I, was, I had a hard time with this one as well. I think this um, one was a little easier for me to pick, to be honest. For me, it wasn't. But I'll tell you a little bit about why. The next fight is Nasrat Hakparast versus Alex Munoz at 155 pounds. Uh, Nasrat, he's from Germany. He's 11 and 3 overall. He's 24 years old. Another young guy coming into the UFC. Uh, he's 5 feet 10 inches tall. He's 3 and 2 in the UFC. And he's coming off of a first round knockout loss to Drew Dober. Mm -hmm. um, but he does have significant wins over Mark DeCasey and Joaquim Silva. He beat the Casey by decision, and he knocked out Joaquim Silva. Um, he's going against Alex Munoz. Mal Alex Munoz is an American, 6-0. So on the, on the experience factor, this is part of the issue that I ran into with this fight. He's only 6-0. He's 30 years old. He's 5 feet 9 inches tall, and he's making his official UFC debut. But he did compete on Dana White's Contender Series, and he beat Nick Newell uh, by decision. Mm -hmm. One-handed Nick Newell. Guys? Yeah, one-handed <laughs> one Nick Newell. But I don't take anything away from that because one-handed Nick Newell was able to beat the hell out of a lot of people. Uh, Alex Munoz, he is a team alpha male guy, so he's got some really good training partners and a good coach in your eye favor. And, well, and not to mention, mm. not only is he a team alpha male guy where they're known for being wrestlers, mm -hmm. he's kind of a top dog in that area. He is the wrestling coach at Team Alpha Male. So, you know, he has yeah. that, you know, when you, when you talk about that grappling, that wrestling, Mm-hmm. If you're good enough to be the coach of all those guys that are really good wrestlers, you got some wrestling credentials. Yeah. And then, but when I look at it, you know, we're looking at his record. He's not an active fighter by any means. You know, he fought one time in 2019, one time in 2018, skipped all of 2017, and fought, what, twice in 2016? And well, then you know, twice in 2015. So, I mean, he, it's uh, wasn't even one of those really, things. He wasn't even really planning on getting into MMA, though. So he was brought in to be a training partner for somebody else who had a fight coming up. Mm -hmm. And he was brought in as a training partner, and somehow that transitioned him into actually becoming a fighter. And it was actually, I want to say it was a Johnny Hendricks. Johnny Hendricks brought him in because him and Johnny Hendricks wrestled on the same team together at Oklahoma State. He, he wrestled at Oklahoma State. He was wrestled at Oklahoma State at 165 pounds. You know, so he was brought in for, for Johnny Hendricks to help him out because they were buddies. Um... But he does have, have that, that trans, transitioned him into MMA. But for being such an unexperienced guy, like, you got to think about all the, the, the stuff he's already done. You know, he was the former Trinity Kings 155-pound champion right out the gate already, uh, former Cuff champion, you know, right out, right out of the gate. So, like, he's already got a couple of championships under his belt, even though he's 6-0. and uh, He has three decision wins, so three of his fights have come by decision. Mm -hmm. He has two knockouts, and he has one submission but you know when you look over at uh nasrat nasrat's not looking to submit anybody no you know nasrat's looking to knock you out with the nine knockouts that he has and he has two decisions so of his 11 wins he's put nine people out cold mm -hmm. you know or he's he's got the w with strikes yeah he 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 was knocking dudes out cold before he got into the ufc yeah um he's only finished one fight in the ufc yep. But but he was killing people beforehand. <laughs> yeah, he was killing dudes. And when you watch his striking, you'll see why. He has some very pretty Wicked striking. striking. Um, the only thing that uh, you know, I, I guess I would take away from him is he does get taken down 
um, which is going to be in, obviously, Munoz's strength. Yes. But if you watch the Marcin Held fight, every single time he got taken down, he was able to get right back up. So, I mean, we're going to see if he's able to do that again. Uh, but for me, I think that, you know, just the the competing more often, being in the cage and fighting, there's just that experience that you get when you're actually doing it a lot versus someone who's not doing it a lot. So I think that's going to play a little bit into this. And I think, uh, for me, you're going to see um, Nazrat win this one. Whew, another one we're opposite? Yeah, another yeah, one buddy. we're opposite. Another one we're opposite. But, you know, because... But I think he's going to win it with a uh, second-round knockout. So here's where uh, I run into a difference there. You talked about how good Newell was, was with his strike, or not with his striking, but with his grappling. He's pretty good with his grappling. He's pretty good. Now, if you look what happened when they fought, Alex Munoz outgrappled him the entire I would expect fight. him to, though. You know, I would expect he, a lot of two-handed grapplers that are, that are well-versed in grappling to beat another guy with only one hand in grappling. You, you can't you can't say that though. You can't assume because if you look at what if you look at what Newell's done as a fighter, Nick Newell's no slouch. You got by knockout round two, and I have Munoz to win by decision. I think he takes him down. I think he grinds him out. You, you know? ain't gonna be able to keep him down. Uh, I'm telling you. Well, we'll find out. We There's will a difference. Find out. American wrestling is different than international wrestling. The one mm. thing that American wrestling has the advantage of. And this is why a lot of our American wrestlers have been so good at, at dominating with the ground and pound. Is American wrestling is all about control on the ground. So I think he's going to have the ability to control him on the ground. We'll find out though. The biggest thing that you do run into is the the six and zero. Oh, you know, it's not a ton of experience versus a guy who's got almost fifteen fights. Yeah. So that's the biggest difference. But you also have to take into consideration the same thing that Joe Rogan talks about all the time, with uh, guys having a lifetime of competition with wrestling and grinding and that type of practice and stuff. So that does that is combat competition. Not fight competition, but combat competition. But then we move on to the next fight. This one's Tim the Dirty Bird Means versus Loriano Pepe Staropoli at 170 pounds. Tim Means, he's the American. He's 29, 12, and 1. He's 36 years old. He's 6 feet 2 inches tall. And he made his UFC debut back in 2012 versus Bernardo Magalhaes. Um, he was cut from the UFC after going two and two, and then he went on to Legacy and he picked up two wins, and uh, he resigned with the UFC in 2014, and he's been with the UFC ever since then. So uh, he's a guy that's been around for a long, long time in the UFC. Mm -hmm. He's 11, nine and one overall in the UFC, um, coming off of a submission loss to Daniel Sanchez, and then he fights Loriana Staropoli from Argentina. He's nine and two, uh, 27 years old. Six feet one inches tall, two and one in the UFC, coming off of a decision loss to Muslim Salikov, who's a monster. Mm -hmm. um, but both of his wins in the UFC come by decision over Hector Aldana and Tiago Alves. Yeah. What do you think about these guys? So Tim's obviously you, you touched on that. He's a long time UFC vet. Um, one of the things that Tim doesn't do well is win. I mean. Mm -hmm. He is, if we look at just his last nine fights, he's three and five in his last nine with one no contest. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you, you got to look, take that into consideration. If you watch him, Tim is a wrestler. He, uh, and did you know that the only reason he got into MMA was after doing a prison, se uh, prison yeah. sentence for meth? Yep. So, it, it, it actually starts back prior to that. So, he got hooked onto meth because uh, of an incident where he was. He was involved in an incident outside of a bar in which he got shot in the leg. So then he was shot in the leg, and the, the doctors had, had prescribed him morphine and other prescription pills. And as soon as that, that prescription was pretty much taken away from him, you know, he was having addiction issues, and that led to him moving over to methamphetamine. And then uh, he was eventually sentenced to five years in prison. Served three and a half, served, I think, yeah, is what served, they said. Served three and a half years in prison. Um, he got released, and then he was working... Uh, Gosh, where was he working? He was working at, I want to say like a garbage company. It was company a janitor. Yeah, janitor I think it's janitorial yeah. or garbage man. Something like I think it was janitor. He was a janitor or something. Yeah, it was something like that. And and one of the people he was working with, um, you know, kind of suggested that he goes and trains. Yeah. And that whole thing turned into a life uh, a life changing experience for him that turned into a long career in the UFC. Yeah. And he already had a wrestling base. Yeah. So, I mean, he was already, he was wrestling in high school and stuff uh, before that, so. Yeah. But, uh, you know, he 
his stand-up is, is really wild, and he's never improved it, ever. You know, and it's so funny, though, because he's actually got a winning professional boxing record. Yeah, yeah I think he's 2-1. 2-1 two, two and one. One. Two and one as a pro professional boxing. boxer. Yeah, but so it's funny that you say that. You have that. to look at competition um, now, too. Um, well, yeah, I mean, but even then, look at what he's done in MMA. Like, his, yeah. his, his, his striking is wild, but he still has 19 knockouts. He does. He has 19 knockouts, 5 submissions, and uh, 5 decisions. For so he's me, looking to kill. When I when I think of Tim Means, I think of the old school MMA guys that you know they have the wrestling base and then they just throw hands mm -hmm. and don't care. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what he does. He he throws hands, doesn't care. He'll trade shots for shot with you, and that's been part of his downfall throughout his career. Is he's willing to take a punch to give a punch. He just can't actually take a punch very no. well. No, so. <laughs> no, he can't actually take a punch. But you know. Um, that's part of the reason he's 11 and 9 inside of the UFC. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of guys that if they would just change up their style a little bit, their records would be significantly better. But some people just em embrace that war. Yeah. But, you know, uh, before getting to the UFC, though, he was a catchweight champion for King of the Cage, 160 pounds for King of the Cage, and he defended that belt four times. At a catch weight, so it's kind of weird. I, or, I don't. I'm, what is with these catch weight champions in these regional promotions? Well, they called it promotions? like super lightweight or something like that, but it's not even. Re, it's not a real weight weight class. Um, when you put title fights on your cards, it makes it look better, right? So if I'm trying to sell my regional or my smaller show, what do I do? I put a title fight on there, try to sell out more tickets, right? So that's yeah. what happens there. But he, you know, so he was there, 160 pound champion, defended it four times. Uh, he also won their 155-pound belt at one point as well. So he's got all those things going on there. Uh, but, you know, Loriana Staropoli is young and new to the UFC. Um, not brand new. Like we said, 2-1. and one. Mm -hmm. Both the wins coming by decision. Um, actually, before signing to the UFC, though, Staropoli was also a police officer. Yep. Um, so it was a part-time, you know, you know, training and fighting was a part-time thing. Signed to the UFC, kind of, kind of became a, a full-time full -time gig. <laughs> yeah, so, you can't part-time in the UFC. No, it's, I it's mean, hard. no. I'm, people try. You see what happens. Yeah, you know, it affects their ability to be the best that they can be. But he has five knockouts, and he has two submissions, and he has two decisions. What do you think? Yeah. So I mean, with Staropoli, um, he his striking is very, very good. Yes. Very good. Yes. He faint. He has really, really nice feints to bait you in to get you to throw when he wants you to throw. I think Joe Rogan mentioned it actually in one of uh, his fights. I forgot which fight it was, but he actually commented on it and said, you know, he's got these feints. He's trying to get you to throw when he wants you to throw, mm -hmm. and it works because these dudes are throwing when he wants them to throw, and he's content with just sitting there picking you apart and feinting all the time. Yep, um, I was really excited with the striking. Yeah, he, I like I like the way that it looks. He switches his stances a lot too, so if He's having problems one way. He'll he doesn't care. He'll switch to the other way and see if he has success that way. Yeah. So, um, you're gonna see that he has very good takedown defense too. And I don't know that Tim's takedowns and his wrestling is enough or good enough, I guess, to actually get Staropoli down and keep him down. Because Staropoli shows that he's able to defend the takedown, and if he does get taken down, he's also able to get back up. Yeah. And those kind of fighters are dangerous. If you can't hold them down, those guys are dangerous. Yeah, you know, um, I, I agree with you. Um, ultimately, I think that uh, Staropoli's got too good a striking. Mm. Yep. Um, I, I do give Tim Means the respect, but like you talked about earlier, he's kind of chinny. He's you very know, he, chinny. He's not very good at taking a punch. And uh, because of that, I think that Staropoli knocks him out in round two, potentially even round one, but I'm going with round two. Yeah, so for me, I've got Staropoli knockout round one. Mm. I think that Tim So we is, got we got to fight we the finally, same. We finally picked the same guy here, but uh, I, just, I just don't like Tim Means' chin. And I think he's, he's very hittable. He's willing to brawl, and that is going to be his downfall, is that he's willing to stand and trade with Staropoli, who will put him away if he does that. Yeah. So, yeah, round um, one knockout's my opinion. All right, so round, so round one knockout for you. I got round two, but, you know, we both got some knockouts going on there. Um, so then we move on to the, the next fight. This is a last-minute fight that they put on there due to the situation that happened um, last week with Kevin Holland versus Trevin Giles, um, mm -hmm. and Trevin Giles passing out it, uh, before being able to walk out to the fight. Um, they rescheduled Kevin Holland for this week. So. Yeah. 
part of the, the reason they're not giving their fighters, like I know a lot of people were upset about this. The UFC is not paying all their fighters all their money. He's, you know, Dana White said we're giving them some money. But he's trying to rebook these guys to get them their fights anyway. So, you know, if, if, if they're going to rebook a guy a week or two later, I'm okay with them not giving them the full money. But if they're going to say, hey, you know, you missed the fight, you're going to have to wait eight, you know, eight weeks, two months to fight again. Right. You know, pay them all their money. But like in Kevin Holland's instance, you know, Kevin Holland just got extra money. He wasn't planning on making it in the first place, you know, because he didn't get that fight, but he got paid a little bit for it. Yeah. Now he's got this one. So, you know, if I'm Kevin Holland, I might have been upset about that. But you know what? I'm, I'm happy that I get, I get another opportunity to come out and compete and make even more money. Mm -hmm. That I wouldn't have had and before. Still have a chance at the bonus, so. Still have a chance at the bonus. Um, so right now, let's jump into it real quick with Kevin Holland versus Joaquin Buckley. So Kevin Holland, he's an American. He's 17 and 5. Um, he's 27 years old, and he's 6 feet 3 inches tall. And he's going against uh, Joaquin Buckley, who's also an American. Um, he's 26 years old. He's 5 feet 10 inches tall, and he's 10 and 2 overall. Tell me what you think about these guys. Or actually, it's worth noting, Joaquin Buckley is making his UFC debut as mm -hmm. well. What do you yeah. think about these guys? Well, you know, last week I was big on Kevin Holland. Yeah. Uh, versus uh, a guy that I think is actually better than uh, Joaquin Buckley. So I'm still pretty big on Kevin Holland. Um, you know, we talked about that Kevin Holland's pretty well-rounded, has good grappling, good stand-up. He seems to be just about good, or just about good everywhere, you know. He has that kung fu black belt, and he's adapted it to MMA pretty well, you know. Um, and he was the uh, the BJJ brown belt under Travis Luter that we mentioned before as well. Clearly, you can see the guy has got striking. He's transitioned it well to MMA. You know, wushu uh, uh, kung fu doesn't necessarily transition well to street fights. Other things, kind of MMA, especially when you got other really well trained strikers. Yeah. Um, but he's he's done a pretty good job transitioning that and making it more applicable to his trade mm -hmm. um his bjj brown belt under travis luter and he's shown that he's he's comfortable on the ground he's comfortable on the feet so he's comfortable just about everywhere then you get in with uh joaquin, joaquin man um buckley is a boxer dude he's a big strong boxer too yeah well, and so, you know, he, he's knocked out a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, so he has actually, I think it's seven knockouts to his record. Um, yeah, so seven knockouts and three decisions of his ten wins. Yeah, no submissions. So no submissions. You know he doesn't want to go to the ground. He wants to stand in bay. Mm -hmm. It's also worth noting, though, he just fought. So he just fought in LFA on the 31st. Yeah, July so, 31st. So he, you're, he looking, you're looking at, you know, including today, you're looking at four days ago. Yeah. So um, he's in shape. He was able to get a good quick win. Um, in the second round, he knocked the guy out with punches. Surprise, surprise, like we were talking about with the, with the, the boxing there. Um, he's out here ready to go. So you have to take into consideration the fact that he is getting the full camp as well, whereas Kevin Holland is coming off of a full camp as well for the most part. I think he had right. two weeks or something like that, maybe mm -hmm. a little bit longer for the last one, but he didn't, you know, he had as much of a camp as you're going to get during this time right now for UFC and COVID yeah. times. So, uh, both guys should be in shape. It'll be interesting to see what happened though. What did, uh, Joaquin do after his fight? Mm -hmm. You know, was he taking a break for a week? Did yeah. He go out, I mean, did he go out and party for a little bit and, you know, get this call and I was like, Oh yeah, I'm ready to go. go. You know, cause you know, if you decide that, Hey, I won, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get some drinks and take a few days off which is what a lot of fighters do, right? It goes yeah. to vacation time right after a fight camp. He might not be feeling as good with his body right now. You know, we'll, we'll see. But if he didn't, he's ready to go. Yeah, and then, you know, um, Holland was training for another striker mm -hmm. in Giles. Yes. Um, but Giles is a much different striker. He's taller, rangier, lankier, throws a lot more kicks versus um, you have Buckley, who is pretty it's much be purely hands. a boxer. Yeah. He'll throw an occasional kick. To, he'll mix it in every now and then to kind of just throw you off or whatever. But he's a boxer, dude, and he's looking to knock you out with those hands. Yeah. But if you go in, he is prone to being taken down. If you watch the uh, the Logan uh, Storley fight, mm -hmm. Logan Storley was able to get in there, 
take him down and control him for the better part that, of three rounds. That was the one at Bellator? I, yeah, it was a Bellator fight. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, for me, he's a boxer with – he's he's kind of got okay defense, but I think most of his defense on the ground is his strength because he is so strong. So he's just trying to just manhandle his way to defense, which eventually costs him some energy and stuff like that. And I think that Kevin Holland, you know, he's got some good takedowns. He's a BJJ brown belt. I don't know that he wants to stand and trade with this guy, even though he's a kung fu guy. Kung fu versus boxing, we've seen that before. Well, it's, it's the option, you know, the ability to change it up and mix it mm-hmm. around. Yeah, we know kung fu ain't going to work against Western boxing. It doesn't It doesn't no, happen. Kung that's what I mean. We've seen no. it before. Uh, but Kevin Holland's striking style, wouldn't. it, it, it doesn't really look kung fu. It's not kung fu. It looks more karate-ish, it, to be honest. It's, just, but... it's funny to see kung fu on there, you know, like it's actually helping him out. I don't think that it's doing anything for him. But it just, you know, it helps build that resume. Hey, I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm a kung fu guy too. Um, but you were going to go into your uh, pick for that one right there real quick? Yeah, man. I, I, so I was rudely cut you off. <laughs> I was getting to my pick. You know, like I said, I think this fight is going to be extremely similar to that Logan Storley fight. I think that you're going to see Kevin Holland working for those takedowns. I don't think he wants to stand and trade with this guy. Um, and if he does, you'll probably just see him utilize a lot of kicks to keep that distance. But ultimately, I think he's going to get it down. I think he's going to grind out a decision over him. Well, I think and it, and it plays in perfectly for him because you look at the last guy he was training for. Mm-hmm. Another person I don't really think he wanted to stand and bang with. No. So I think that he's coming off of a uh, camp where he was probably more than likely training to try to get the fight to the ground, going in against another striker where he's going to want to try to get the fight to the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think he's going to rush in to try to take it down right away. No. I think you're going to see moving around on the feet a little bit trying to play and feel each other out there. And then eventually, you know, Kevin Holland's going to find that opening. He's going to close the distance. He's going to drag it down to the mat. And he is going to end up drawing it out. He's probably, given the fact that both guys have come off of a good camp, yeah, more than likely looking for a decision, Kevin Holland. Decision Kevin Holland win? We got Boom. another perfect pick right there, baby. Right there. Oh, wow. That's our first perfect of the night, man. man. So that's the, that ends the undercard there. Yeah, it is. And then we move into another uh, good, exciting main card here. Um, I, what's that? I said another hard fight to pick. <laughs> yeah. Oh, damn. Yeah, so this one here, kicking off the night, we have Benil Benny Dariush versus Scott Hot Sauce Holtzman at 170 pounds. Um, Benil Dariush, he's out of Iran. He's 18, 4, and 1, 31 years old, 5 feet 10 inches tall, 12, 4, and 1 in the UFC. He's, got four, he's a four-time performance of the night winner. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's currently on a four-fight win streak, with his most recent being a knockout over Drakkar Close in the second round. Um, and now he's going against Scott Holtzman. Um, and Scott Holtzman is American. He's 14-3, and three, 36 years old, so he's a little bit older, um, 5 feet 9 inches tall, but he's 7-3 and three in the UFC, and he's currently on a two-fight win streak, with his most recent win being a decision win over Jim Miller who was a former top five guy for a long time. Yeah. What do you think about these guys? It's it, This is an exciting fight for me because I've been pretty big on Benil Dariush. Uh, when, I, when I first watched his UFC debut, he just was super fun. Like, he was explosive, and uh, I just really liked what I saw with him. You know, and to add on to uh, his, you know, his four-fight win streak and knockout win, he actually is coming off three straight finishes because he has two submission wins prior to that knockout. Mm-hmm. And the actual, that's his bread and butter. His submission wins is what he's looking for. Yeah. That's what you're going to want, uh, Den- Benil's going to be doing. He's going to be looking to drag this thing down. Um, he's pretty well rounded. He has a black belt in Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu. So obviously he can stand and bang. He can take this to the ground and he's good either way. Yeah. Um, when you get it though with Holtzman, Holtzman looks strong as dude. Like he he just looks strong. Um and he I don't even think if I remember right, he wasn't really a wrestler in school, wasn't boxing. I don't even think he got really into MMA until he after he graduated high school. Yeah. So I mean he's you know, he's thirty six now, so he's obviously had some time to train and add things to his repertoire, but you know, um he has a BJJ brown belt now. Yes. So he's he should be comfortable on the ground. When I watched a lot of his fights... But but we did talk about there being levels, right? Yeah, there's levels to so. it. Um, I didn't see who he was a BJJ brown belt under. 
Um, cause they're there. You've seen brown belts under one guy who are actually black belts under another guy, or you can see them what, white belts what, or black what, belts. You know, who would, who is able to beat these black belts from other guys. Right. Um, you know, we've seen that in jujitsu tournaments all the time too. I did see though, they have a comparable fighter in there, mm -hmm. um, in Drew Dober. Yep. So Drew Dober was submitted by Dariush. Yep. Um, that was a first round submission or no, sorry, a second round submission. But then uh, Drew Dober also beat Holtzman by decision. Yep. Um, obviously, MMA math doesn't play out that way. Doesn't always work. But, you know, if I'm looking at it and I'm trying to think about uh, names and seeing how these guys do, have done, Darius, like, he's got, he's got a, a hit list of guys that he's taken out. Yeah, man. So we talked about Jim Miller. We talked about Dr Drew Dober. Uh, how about Diego Ferreira? He beat Diego Ferreira. He also beat Michael Johnson. You know, Michael Johnson's a guy that I think could, could have potentially been a, one of the best in the world, has all the athletic ability, but doesn't have the mental, mental cast, uh, uh, fortitude. Uh, yeah, I guess mental fortitude, I guess, to do Good it, word. you know, so he beat, he beat Michael Johnson. And then he also beat Mike, or, uh, James Vick as well. Yeah. You know, so if you look at who has, like, the better wins, in my opinion, Dariush. He does. If you look at who has got, who's got the experience, Dariush. Um, Dariush is also a three-time silver medalist and, uh, at the Jiu-Jitsu World Tournament. He's a one-time bronze medalist. Um, he's also a three-time world no-gi champion, one-time silver medalist, and a one-time bronze medalist. So, you know, not only is he a black belt, but he is a proven black belt against competition. Right. And one of the big things about Jiu-Jitsu and their, their belts, uh, a lot of it was primarily based on competition and what you're doing. So Dariush took him only five years to get his black belt. Yeah, like that's that's, insane. that's how good and how fast he's. Like I know people who have been brown belts for longer than five years. Yeah, you know. So it took him five years to get that that black belt from white to black. That's insane. That's insanely fast. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and then he went out and competed at a level that proves that he was worthy of being promoted at that speed. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so so. That versus somebody else who is a brown belt makes it a little bit hard for me. Holtzman is the uh, former XFC 155-pound champion, though, so he, he does have title fights under his belt as well, but it's not the same as world championship fights. No. Or world championship tournaments. No. Um, ultimately, in this fight, though, I think it's going to the ground. I think Darius submits him. I think he gets him in round two. Okay. So for me... Uh... You know, Holtzman's never been finished, mm -hmm. and he's very strong. Like I was mentioning that earlier, he's very, very strong. Um, he he does defend the takedown pretty well. We saw that a while, uh, a few times, but we did also see a guy in Nick Lentz who was able to drag him down several times throughout that fight and etch out a decision win. Mm -hmm. I think this is going to go extremely similar to the Nick Lentz fight. I think you're going to see uh, Dariush getting him down. Uh, I think you're going to see Holtzman kind of get up a couple times, defend off his back a little bit, but ultimately I think Dariush wins with a decision. So you got a decision on there. All mm -hmm. right. I just think that there's levels to it. I think somebody's competed at the level that Dariush will or has. I think he's proven his, his uh, black belt, and you know I just think that gives him the edge there. But we'll find out here. Yeah. So we've got a lot of we, we started moving towards the main card. We have a lot of the similar fighters pick now. Yeah. Um, we have one perfect pick. One perfect pick. You know, but you another know, one's just different rounds. Yeah, it, it's getting interesting. So usually we have a similar undercard, and then and then uh, it, it changes a little bit on the main card. This time it seems so far our main card's more similar than our undercard. So then we move on to the next fight. This one's at 135 pounds for the females. This is Foxy Yana Kutskaya. She's ranked number eight, going against Yulia Stoliarenko. Um, Yana is from Russia. She's 12 and five. She's 30 years old. She's five feet eight inches tall, and she's two and two in the UFC. Most recent losing, recently losing to Aspen Ladd um, mm -hmm. in in round three by TKO. Aspen Ladd's a top prospect for the UFC right now for the females. Um, but she does have two decision wins in the UFC over, uh, Marion Renau and Lena Landsberg. So, you know, she's got a couple, she's got a good win in there over Lena. I feel like that's a pretty good one there. Um, but she's going against 
Yulia Stolaryenko from Lithuania. She's nine and three and one. She's 27 years old, five feet, seven inches tall. So she's going against Yulia Stolaryenko, who's from Lithuania. She's nine, three and one overall. She's 27 years old. She's five feet, seven inches tall. Um, and she is the current Invicta FC 135 pound champion. Um, now that she's in the UFC, they'll get a new champion. But she also competed on the Ultimate Fighter, uh, where she went two and or she went one and two. Mm -hmm. um, she lost to uh, Panny Kinziad, and then on the Ultimate Fighter finale, they gave her a shot against Leah Ledson. So that was her official UFC debut. She lost that fight. She was cut right. from the UFC, and then now she's making her way back. Um, making her way back. Making her way back into the UFC, coming off of. Her win over Lisa, uh, Lisa Verzosa. You might actually know who she is. Mm -hmm. So her name is formerly Lisa the, Sprang uh, Lisa the Strangler Spangler. Um, she's a Pacific Northwest girl from right here in Vancouver, Washington. Yep. Um, so that's who she ended up winning a split decision win over Lisa Spangler. And if or, you sorry, watch Lisa that fight. Lisa Verzosa. I, I'm sorry, Verzosa. It's, it's yeah. hard for me to say it because I've known her as... Since she was wrestling in high school as I know. Lisa Spangler. But if you watch that fight, holy shit, that was a bloodbath. Mm -hmm. That fight was ridiculously bloody. If you're if Lisa you're, Spangler got cut up bad. They both got beat up, dude. Lisa had a cut that literally went from here all the way down to here, stopped, oh, it was and then wicked. went and then went over to here. But in her face, when she was bleeding all over the mat, it the mat was, was red. And then if you looked at uh, Yulia, man, her face was bloody as hell, too. It was just crazy. But it was it, a it fun wasn't, fight. It wasn't the cut that Lisa had, that's for sure. No. But, I mean, that was one of the wickedest cuts I've seen in a it while. It was a nasty cut, and I can't believe the doctors let that one go. I can't believe they let that one go. Because they had the doctors check it, and the doctors like, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And they did. And they went to a decision, and that was a fun fight. And Yulia actually only won that split decision over that one. Yeah. Um, Which is crazy. Imagine what, how things... Might have turned out had there been no big cut like that. Yeah. You know? Dude, it was nuts. But uh, Yulia is a BJJ brown belt, you know. Yep. Um, and in some of her fights, she, she likes to try to pull guard. It looks like, to me, she's actually a little bit more comfortable on the ground. Um, and it, it's a dangerous so, game, though. Pulling guard, pulling guard it is. is a dangerous game. Like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, there's that old saying. I can't remember who it came from, you know. Everybody's a black belt till they get hit in the face. Yeah. You know? You you can have that game plan in your mind of what you're going to do. You're going to work all those jujitsu moves and stuff like that. But once you start getting hit in the face, it, it starts to go out the window for some people. Obviously, though, with Yulia, she's got nine submissions. Yeah, she does have so nine submissions. That doesn't play it into uh, as much of effect there. Yeah. She uses her head to block a lot of punches, though. <laughs> um that's kind of like her, her, her big problem that I've seen. She kind of just bull rushes into punches. So she'll get clipped, and that's kind of how yeah. she's lost some of her fights when she gets TKO'd. Yeah. Um, but if you look at Yana, she's a striker too. Yeah, I like watching she her She is a striker through and through, man. That girl started competing in hand-to-hand -hand combat at 12 years old. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous, guys. Yeah. 12 years old. Um, if you look at a lot of Yana's fights, even if you go to the Cyborg fight, uh, Yana actually was able to take Cyborg down, and Cyborg's a very well-known BJJ specialist. Yeah, who just doesn't use it because she's so much bigger and stronger than all these girls. She just knocks them out, which is end up what she ended up doing to uh, Yana. <laughs> it was knocking her out. Um, you know, there was a point in that fight where she actually had Cyborg's back and was threatening with a rear naked. So she yeah. clearly has some ground skills too, even though she's a striker. You know, and, and her her thing about like the striking. Uh... You know, she started she started in Taekwondo in like yep, two thousand seven. Her sister too. You know, so two thousand seven she was doing Taekwondo or she was a Russian Taekwondo champion. She started earlier than that. Um, she was a two thousand seven Ukado World Champion, two thousand ten Bushido Women's MMA champion, and uh, she was the two thousand eleven Russian Muay Thai champion. Like so that striking, it's all there. She, and it's she's all there. Got it. But like you said, she's been training in hand to hand combat. Since she was 12 years 12 old. 12 years old. And 12 that, years old. Hand to hand includes so, ground fighting. You, you got to think, you know, that's 18 years that she spent. You know, she's 30 years old right now. 18 years she spent training in hand to hand combat. Yeah, it's just wicked. Pretty man. impressive. Yeah, her sister's no slouch either. I wouldn't yeah, want to mess she, with her she's either. Got, uh, <laughs> you know, she's got 
you know, she's got seven knockouts ultimately in MMA, mm -hmm. four decisions and one submission. Um, you know, you don't see the submission game there very often, but that's mostly because of how comfortable she is with her hands. Yeah. But like you were just talking about, she has the ability to do some things on the ground as we saw against Cyborg. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, in this fight, this was a tough fight for me, but I had to pull with Yana, um, and I went with Yana by decision. All right, so for me, I felt like, you know, Yana is, she's the striker, right? She's, but she also likes to push in and get in the clinch and grind against the fence and try to do that. I don't think she's going to do that in this fight because Yulia is more than willing to grab her and just try to pull her down into the guard. She likes to do that. That's yep. like what she loves to do. I don't know why, but she's comfortable doing it. Well, she'll try to stand and fight with you. She does have yeah. three three wins in kickboxing. Yeah, and but you'll see also in that, like we were just talking about in the Spangler Strangler fight. Yeah. Um, she stood and traded. She she's stood willing and traded. to they stand had, and trade. She's they had a to wicked. Do they had oh, it was a wicked wicked. It was brawl. fun. It was it, it was, was awesome. messy. It was it was crazy. Um, but I do agree, you know, I think at the end of the day, Yana is the better fighter overall. I think she's fought the tougher competition. I think she's proven herself against tougher competition. And I think she just has more tools on the feet to keep this thing going. And I have her winning a hard-fought decision as well. Ooh, there we go. So we get sim more similar on this main card. But then we move on to the next one, though. This one was Ma uh, Maki Coconut Bombs Patolo versus Darren the Dentist Stewart at 185 pounds. This was a uh, hard one for me to pick. Dude, they've, they've all been so hard. A lot of them were hard. They're a lot, a, a lot closer you know, than, than they might look on paper, or either they looked really close on paper when, when they were matching them up. That's why they did it. But they put together a fan-friendly card from top to bottom. That they um, did. Darren Stewart, he's from England. He's 11 and 5. He's 29 years old, 6 feet tall, 4 wins, 4 losses, and 1 no contest in the UFC. Um, he's on his second run inside of the UFC right now. He is coming off of a loss in Cage Warriors in March. Mm -hmm. um, he's going against Maki Patolo, who's an American, who's 13, five, 13 and 5, 29 years old. And then he earned his... Uh, UFC contract on uh, Dana White's Contender Series with a body shot that led to the fight being stopped there. Um, and then right now he's coming off of a knockout win over Charles Bird by, in round two. What do you think about these guys? Dude, it's, you know, you touched on it just going into it. It's another really hard fight to pick. So, Darren, you know, you did touch that he's, he's uh, on his second stint in the UFC. Um, he also... Holds a black belt in Taekwondo. Yes. He likes to kick. And if yes. you watch some of his fights, you'll see that. You'll see that he'll throw those, he'll throw kicks all day. Leg kicks, big, strong, powerful leg kicks, though. He throws with a lot of power in almost all of his strikes. He's gotten uh, his hands, though, in one of his fights. He threw almost nothing but hands. Looked real comfortable doing it, too. You know, and, and the weird thing about him is, so, like, I say this is his uh, second stint in the UFC because he went to Cage Warriors. Right, in between. I don't know why he went to Cage Warriors, though, because he was... Coming he off was two wins in a row? Coming off of two wins in a row, like yeah. we're talking about, you know, over Darren Wynn. And that was a fun fight. And, uh, you know, I'm off the Darren Wynn train myself, personally. Um, but, you know, he has been involved in some fun fights. He just comes mm -hmm. up on the losing end of them. Uh, but, you know, so he was, he was on a two-fight win streak, and then he went to cage warriors i wonder if maybe it was he just couldn't get into america or what i don't know why but nah, it's kind of curious that he he left because you it's not very often we do see it every once in a while where a guy leaves and they're they're on a, a a win streak but most of the time when the guys are leaving the ufc they're exiting on losses right multiple losses so, too or a really really bad loss in which or a boring style yeah super with, boring with, something you know your first loss and they're looking for an excuse to get rid of you yeah so uh, I mean, I thought that that was interesting. Um, you know, this this fight right here, though, I was super excited about it. It's a very, very fun fight overall. This is made for the fans. You're going to see some really good stuff, like you said. Uh, Darren has that black belt in uh, Taekwondo, mm -hmm. but he also has a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Yep. Um, he fought on a show with the, the, a really weird name, Killa Cam. So he's the former 205 Killa Cam champion. All right. Um, not sure how I feel about the the name of the promotion. 
a little bit weird, but yeah, whatever. I mean, name your promotion whatever you want, dude. It's your money. Yeah, yeah, it is. If you don't make it, that's your problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, seven knockouts and he has four decision wins. Uh, going against Maki Patolo, like we said, you know, he came in w earning his uh, contract with that body shot knock or stoppage from uh, the Contender Series. Yeah. Uh, he did knock out Charles Bird. He's got a win in Bellator as well. He's a former Victory FC 170-pound uh, champion with seven knockouts, um, three submissions, and three decisions. Mm -hmm. So, well, when I when I look at win too, you know, or not win, um, but when uh, Stewart fought win, <laughs> win took him down. I think he he attempted like 11, 12, some odd takedowns throughout the whole fight, and Stewart showed that he's good enough on the ground that he could not only stop some of those takedowns, but when he did get taken down. He, too, was able to get back up. And then in the later rounds, you saw Wynn was the tired fighter. Yeah. And uh, Stewart was, still had a full tank of gas, it looked like, in the third round in that fight. He was dancing around. He actually turned into a boxer, not a kickboxer. He was dancing around and just throwing this jab out while circling, and he looked really well, I mean, good doing it. You're going against the wrestler. You know, you're able to pick him apart at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, why give him the leg and give him the chance to try to take you back down? Yeah, he just looked really, really good doing it, too. Yeah. Like, it, like, like he's not just a Taekwondo specialist. He has boxing, too. Um, but with Potolo, he is a boxer, mm -hmm. and he's willing to brawl. If you watch and some of his fights, I love the way that he puts power behind his mm -hmm. hands. I love the way he puts power behind his hands. But uh, sorry, I interrupted you again. No, you're Go good. Ahead and finish off with what you were well, saying. Well, with Patola, you know, you're talking about the power in his hands, right? Watch that Callum Potter fight. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a super fun fight. Uh, you know, but the problem with it was Maki was on the wrong end of a lot of those exchanges. <laughs> um, it happens, though. It, it does happen. Um, so, but, you know, before I go into my pick, let's. you got anything else to add on that? No, I'm good on that. All right, man. I'm, so, I'm I mean, ready. so for me, I think what you're going to see is because there's not really a threat of wrestling with Maki, is I think you're going to see a lot more kicks mm -hmm. from Stewart. I think he's going to work that leg, he try needs to, to work that's the gonna, movement. That's the range that he needs to be at. Exactly. He needs to be at a striking range with the hands, mm -hmm. but he needs to be at range where he can connect with the feet. Yep. And that's going to be his advantage right I there. think that's where you're going to see. I think you're going to see him try to take away Maki's movement. I think he's going to beat that leg up for a little bit. Um, and then when you get in there, you're going to see in the second round, he's going to start landing some bombs. And Stewart is a very big middleweight. Mm -hmm. Very big. Um, and very strong. <laughs> so, but I have Stewart with a second round knockout. You got Stewart with a second round knockout. Yeah, buddy. All right. So you think that he's just going to be able to wear him down? He's going to use those leg kicks. I think he's going to take away and that then... movement with the leg kicks, and then by the time the second round comes around, that's all she wrote. So we're different here again. So uh, I've got Maki Patolo winning by knockout in round one. Okay. Like I said, I really like that power. I like the way that he mixes it up. I like the way that he transitions and throws to the body and to the head. Um, I think that overall his hands look really good. His movement looks really good. Darren Stewart, he's got those five losses uh, on his record. Mm -hmm. I just don't know that, uh, that he's going to be able to really handle what Maki's going to do with the hands. We'll find out, though. I mean, he went to a decision with Shabazian. Yeah, he did go with it. Too. And it was a split decision but loss. What what did we notice about Shabazian here? But this, that was against this, a grappler. This past weekend, though. But Shabazian, he tired out. A little he bit. He tired out a lot. Um, the, that could have been because of the eye poke or the raking in the eye right before the big I think elbow. the eye poke and then the, the strikes that followed played a big part in that. Well, I think it was the eye poke. I think the biggest thing that changed effect in that fight was when, when you saw um, he was raking in his eyes, right? And remember, because when we were watching the show, I was talking about, mm -hmm. oh, he's, he's raking his eyes, raking his eyes. And then, boom, all of a sudden, here comes that big elbow yeah. to Shabazian. And, you know, that was the beginning of the end right there, um, ultimately. Doesn't matter, doesn't change anything. Fight's no, over. No, fight's happened. over, yeah. Um, ultimately, though, it was good for Shabazian to get that right now. He needed that loss. Uh, you can, you know, a loss can, can make or break you. Right now, this is where champions are built. You need to have a good loss to try to rebuild yourself back up as a champion. You know, most people do. Yeah, unless you're John Jones. Yeah. Yeah, unless you're John Jones. Uh, Maki Patolo, knockout round one for me. You've got Stewart, knockout round two. That's right. It's right. worth it to note that Stewart's never been knocked out. 
Well, there's a lot of people who've never been knocked out, but there's also a lot of people who've been knocked out for the first time in their life that happens in the UFC. It happens so. a lot. But, I mean, he's been in the UFC, dude. <laughs> Spicely, um, Bird, Shabazian. I mean, Spicely, I don't, I don't really consider Spicely like a super good win, though. Um, no, he knocked him out in the second round. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then we go into the next one. This one is kind of weird because you have the number 11 ranked Amari the Wolverine Akhmadov versus... The All American, non ranked Chris Weidman. Chris Weidman at 185 pounds. Now, uh, I think most everybody here is going to know, know who Chris Weidman is. I'll run through him real quick. Um, Chris Weidman, he's the American. He's 14 and 5. He's 36 years old, 6 feet 2 inches tall, uh, 10 and 5 in the UFC, and he's the former UFC champion at 185 pounds, knocking out Anderson Silva to get there to the title fight. Um, and he's going, and, and, and so it's kind of weird when you, when you hear what I just told you right there, that he's not ranked. Um, so, well, there's a reason so for that. He's not ranked. There is a reason for that, but he's going against Amari Akhmadov, who's another Dagestani Russian guy. So he comes from that land of the Dagestani monsters. Mm-hmm. Um, he's 24 and one, he's 32 years old. He's six feet tall. He's eight, three and one in the UFC. And he's currently on a three-fight win streak. All three of them coming by decision win over Tim Bosch, Zach Cummings, and Ian Heinish. Those are all good wins. Yeah. What do you think about these guys? Dude, so this, you know, let's get into the reason for why he's not ranked real quick. He, Chris Weidman. He's chinny. Is, in his last six fights, is one and five. All five of those losses have come by knockout. Knockout. He went up to 205 in his last fight to uh, try to get some redemption there. Turned out to be a big mistake because he fought a title challenger in his 205 debut. And got and knocked out. Got knocked out. <laughs> um, but, you know, this is a this is going to be a, a crazy fight because I think this is one. He's coming back down to 185, yes. right? You know, um, in between that, that knockout loss, he did tap out um, – Calvin Gaslam. Calvin, Calvin, Calvin Gaslam. But you also have to look at how Calvin um, Gaslam has been doing recently himself. Yeah, but at Calvin Gaslam, it's been murder row, dude. 2017 is when they fought, so this is right around the time when Kelvin Gaslam really started picking it up a little bit mm-hmm. before he went, or I think right actually in the middle of that time when he started putting that killer, that killing the streak together. Yeah. Um, but so now when you look at this, the Zach Cummins fight, even though it was a unanimous decision win, it was actually really close for the most part. Um Zach Cummins was able to defend a lot of the takedowns. When he did get taken down, he was able to get back up, landed some good shots, and Zach Cummins actually flattened um, Akhmadov. He put him on his back with a punch. And uh, Weidman's a much better striker than Zach Cummins. When you look at that Zach Cummins fight, though, too, he scooped Zach Cummins up and slammed him so hard. That was a power slam. For me, it's, it's so hard for me to pick this fight because I do think it's a lot closer because we keep looking at the fact that Weidman's been knocked out so many times. So, you know, looking back, we got Chris Weidman. You know, you talked about him a little bit. He is that D, D1 uh, All-American wrestler. Mm-hmm. BJJ black belt under Matt Sarah, and also Henzo Gracie is credited as well. Yep. So he's clearly well-versed on the ground. Amari wants to go to the ground. You know, that's that's kind of his bread and butter. You see him looking at all his fights. He likes to take people down. Although he does have more mm-hmm. knockouts than he does submissions. Mm-hmm. So, but I mean... I mean, have, that could be a It could be ground, ground and pound and, pound and some other stuff. things. So. But, you know, so with Chris, the reason why he's unranked, he's one in five, six in his last... Or one in five in his last six fights. Yes. Five knockout losses. Yes. Um, one of those knockout losses, the most recent one, he actually went up to heavyweight. Or not heavyweight, light sorry, heavyweight, light heavyweight. It was supposed to be yeah. a debut in the new weight class, kind of a resurgence in a, in a stumbling career. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he went up to 205 to try to to re uh, boost his career, but he ended up running into a beast. Dominic Reyes, who we saw go the distance with John Jones and fought a very, very yeah. close fight. Some people think Reyes won that fight. Well, a lot, so, a lot of people think Reyes won that. Fight. Yeah, so I mean, um, but so like, that was a like, very like we said before. Though the only thing that matters is the, the judges. Right, there's score three card, people right? that matter. Yep, that's who um, matters. <laughs> so I mean, but that that turned out to be a very very bad person to fight in your 205 debut. Yes. <laughs> um, 
But so now he's coming back down uh, to 185 to fight Omari. Um, for me, Omari, you already said he's another Dagestani dude. I've got that in my notes as well. He's a Dagestani uh, beast. He's another one of those guys, just well-oiled machines. You know, he's a, a master of, um, what the hell do they call that, damn it? Sambo. Yeah, he's a he's master. An international master of sport. Master of sport, Sambo. So he's a second Don Black Belt um, for Sambo. Mm -hmm. um, international master of sport. And he's an international master of sport for hand-to-hand -hand combat Sambo. Right. So they differentiate between the two of them. A little bit different, similar, but different. Um, but, so yeah. yeah, but he's also, you know, if we're talking about those type of things right now, he's also the Governor's Cup tournament champion. So he's gone through ch tournaments before. He's the Pro FC Grand Prix tournament champion as well. Um, you know, it's, as far as what he's done, he's got a lot of championships and that that second Don black belt in Sambo, the international master of sport. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like a very super highly respected very high. title to have, especially when you look at that land of D Dagestani monsters. Like they respect that like to the highest level. Mm -hmm. um, to be able to get to that point, you got to be pretty good at what you're doing. Yeah. As he's proven, you know, with some of his wins over Bosch, Cummings, and Heinisch. So, you, you know. Yeah, and so getting into it, though, I think this fight, it might be a trap fight, to be honest, because I think they were trying to give Weidman a win. Because if you think about it, Weidman's going to be very comfortable on the ground. Omari's going to want to go to the ground. But Omari has not finished a fight in five years. So Weidman is probably thinking, okay, I'm not in a threat to really get knocked out on my feet. So, I mean, it, it could be a trap fight, though, because he's been knocked out five times in his last six fights, so it might not take very much to put him out, right? But, I, I, well, from what I said here, I've got a, I, I want to see oh, what they look like at the weigh-ins. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I want to I see what they look like at the weigh-ins, because for me... It's going to be Chris is going back down, right? I want to see kind of what he looks like, where he's at. But for now, I think that this plays in well for a Chris Weidman decision win. I don't know about that, man. I mean, Chris Weidman's very chinny now. Very chinny. And uh, like we said, even though, even though Amari is a grappler and he wants to get it to the ground, it's like I just said, though, he's got more knockouts than he does anything else. Mm-hmm. He's got seven knockouts. They could very well easily be all ground and pound knockouts. I think that uh, potential, the potential there is if it's going to a decision right now, he has eight decision wins. Mm -hmm. He has seven knockout wins. So I don't really see him losing a decision. And uh, I think that he's going to end up knocking out Weidman. I think he's going to knock him out in the third round because Weidman is chinny. I love Weidman. You know, I don't like uh, seeing wrestlers lose. But unfortunately, you know, I think that his, be his best days are behind him. I, I wish that uh, he would have hung it up a little while ago, you know, because he went on that, that when he was champion, you know, you look at what he did. He beat Anderson Silva Twice. with a knockout, you know. Everybody said it was kind of a fluke. He goes out there, uh, beats Anderson Silva in an even more flukish way in <laughs> which Anderson Silva breaks his leg, mm -hmm. right? Anderson Silva throws the kick. Chris Weidman checks it. His leg breaks. Chris Weidman says, oh, I've been practicing checking legs that way on purpose. So, you know, who knows if he really was or wasn't. doesn't matter. He won the belt. He defended the belt. And then he also successfully defended against the guys like Vitor Belfort and Lyoto Machida. Mm -hmm. Those are all top guys. Yeah. So, you know, if you want to look at that and take that into consideration, it's probably very important. But I think that, you know, Chris Weidman's better days are behind him. And uh, I think that he should retire soon. Yeah. And I it's, think that Omari gets him. Yeah, it's crazy him. though. You look at his last six fights, Dominic Reyes, Ronaldo Souza, Kelvin Gaslam, Gegard Musasi, Yo Romero, Luke Rockle. And, and Luke Rockle. You Vitor know, Belfort. You can go it's, down the list. Just, it's murderers, murderers row. row. Like the, you know, like there, there's nothing against the, the fighters that he's fighting, but you can't take that much damage back to back to back to back. Yeah, I mean you something look, happened to him at that point. Yeah, I mean... After the Luke Rockhold look at, loss? Look at, look at BJ Penn. I don't like seeing BJ Penn fight anymore. You know, he gets hurt by the littlest things now. By fighters that we would we would never even consider, you know, at the time that he's fight, that, that they're fighting him, potential title challengers. Yeah. You know, he's been reduced to something way less than what he was. And to see guys like that continue to fight, 
it kind of hurts their legacy. You know, you come out there being the legend killer. Yeah, you know, for me, I think this is make or break for Weidman it, right here. It, I mean, for him, it's got to be. I think this is a fight it's that he be. can win, and if he doesn't win it, then it's done. This is a must-win situation for Chris Weidman right here. I just don't think he's going to get it done. Akhmedov knocks him out round three. For me, you got, I got Weidman, Weidman by, by decision. decision right now. Pending, I want to see what he looks like at the uh, the weigh-ins because if he looks like shit at the weigh-ins, which he I was might, starting might, to. Yeah, so I might switch up a little bit. Yeah, towards the end of his time at 185, that, that uh, cut down to 85 was starting to look pretty nasty for him. And that's part of why I want to see what he looks like because he's going back down to 185. If he looks healthy and he looks good at 185, I might even give him the finish. You know, Weidman's that guy that can knock anybody out. He can finish a lot of people. He has the power to do it. Um, it it's kind of weird, though, because we talk about like Johnny Hendricks and his rise and fall. Mm-hmm. We like cheeseburgers. Weidman's having a similar fall, you know. Then we move on to the main event. This one is Derek, the Black Beast Lewis versus Alexi, the Boa Constrictor Olenek at a hundred or at two hundred and sixty-five pounds. Derek Lewis, he's the American, twenty-three and seven, thirty-five years old, six feet three inches tall, fourteen and five in the UFCs on a two-fight win streak uh, with a decision over Iliar Latifi and a. Split decision over Blagoj Ivanov in his last two fights. Um, his balls are hot. Then we move on to Alexei Olyanik, the Russian, who's got like one of the most experienced records that you're going to see out there. In MMA. And, uh, in MMA. And what's even more impressive is oftentimes you will see guys with a record that's... that. It's not even often, but a lot of times you'll see guys who have a record where they have over 60 or 70 fights, but their records are, are way more split. Mm -hmm. Right? So, Alexi Olyanik, he's 59 wins. He has 59 wins, 13 yeah. losses, and one draw. It's very rare that you're going to run into a guy with even 50 fights. Yeah. Let alone 73. 73, the 73 total fights? Yeah, 59 wins. Like that's, And that's a huge win differential. And how many there. of those are submissions? Oh, it was like 46. 40, 40, 40 something. 40, yeah. 43, 46, I don't know. Yeah, it's crazy. He's got 40-some-odd submission wins on his record. You know, I, uh, I I actually even skipped putting that all in there because when I was looking at all of his other stuff, you know, you talk about uh, right now, if we if we look at Alexi, so he's 43 years old, yep. 6 feet 2 inches tall. He's 8-4 and four in the UFC, but he's on a two-fight win streak. One of them was a decision win over Fabricio Verdum. His last fight. Um, who's, you know, we both consider him to be one of the goats of heavyweight MMA period. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's a huge win right there. And then he also beat Maurice Green, who just came off another win, looked great uh, about a month ago, was it? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he beat him by armbar. So before, though, even getting to the UFC, he was the WC MMA 265-pound champion. He was the Union of Veterans Tournament champion. He was the Pro FC President Cups uh, Tournament champion. He was the Pro FC Grand Prix champion. He was the M1 Tournament champion, the Inter Pride Tournament champion, the Mini Moto Cup champion, the International Master of Sport in Sambo, and a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Mm -hmm. Like, that guy's been there and done it all outside of winning a UFC heavyweight title. Yeah. He's, he's been everywhere, man. Not only yeah. is he a black belt in BJJ, he's a fourth degree black belt in Jiu Jitsu. Yeah. The guy's just experienced. Like, this guy is the guy who's dedicated himself to martial arts his entire life and to competition, and he goes out there and he wins. Yeah. Probably he's probably got an eighty percent, eighty nine, or he's probably close to 85 percent win rate right now. Something like, like that. It, it's insane. Uh, so how do you see this fight going? So with Derek Lewis, we see when uh, I guess the glass, his last two wins were decision wins. Split but, decision and a unanimous decision. But he did have cardio issues prior to those fights. And even in those fights, towards the third round, you're weighing 264 pounds. You're still feeling it. Yeah. He's going to be looking to get this fight done early. Mm -hmm. I don't think he wants to go another 15 minutes. Um, he never wants to go 15. Yeah, that's just my thing. You know, I, he doesn't want to go 15. He's shown that he can go 15 with some of these guys in there. If he has there. to, yeah. Um, but he gets, when there's wrestlers or really good grapplers, he struggles. He does struggle. He struggles and it, and, against them. And that wears out his cardio. Exactly. You know? He has a hard time with that. And this, we got to remember, this is a five-round main event. Mm -hmm. So, for me, you you go on and you got Olenek, who's 
just super good grappler, went to the ground with Verdun multiple times in that fight and was able to not only defend against him but get his it, own yeah. offense going on the ground too. So that was really fun and exciting for me to watch. Um, I think that this fight is probably going to go similar to the uh, to Lewis's Latifi fight because Latifi went to the decision with Lewis as well. Mm-hmm. Latifi was able to get Lewis down a couple times. He was able to kind of grind him against the cage, but but ultimately Lewis got the better of the exchanges, kind of was able to grind out that decision. But Olenek is not Latifi. He's not Ilya Latifi. He's not Latifi. No. He is a different beast. And what I think is going to happen is I think you're going to see Olenek get this thing down early. He's going to grind on him throughout that first and second round. Third round, my balls are going to be hot, and I'm going to be done. Derek Lewis is going to be tapped out in the third round via submission. Ooh. Derek Lewis has 18 knockouts of his own. Mm-hmm. Right? He doesn't like to go to the ground. Nope. He doesn't want to go to the ground. In fact, he gets frustrated on the ground. Um, I think it's going to go to the ground early. I don't think Olenek's going to want to try to even try to stand and bang with him. No. You know, 18 knockouts is a lot of knockouts. Yeah. You know, that's And he a, puts people out cold. And, They're not TKOs. He puts oh, no, them out cold. They're out cold. He knocks them dead. You know, he, he, he KDs people. He doesn't KO them. He KDs them. He knocks them dead. You know, so um, I don't think Olenek's going to want to stand with him. And I think he's going to take it to the ground fast. I think they're not going to be too, too sweaty or anything by the time they get to the ground. I don't think that Derek Lewis is going to have a clue as, as to what he's, he's going to be getting himself into or what he's going to do down there. And I think Olenek submits him in round one. Okay. Hey, mm. it, might, it might happen. We'll so, find out. But, yeah. I mean, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to start calling uh, Derek Lewis MDK. Murder, death, kill. Yeah. Come on. Where's that from, yeah. people? Demolition, man. Great movie. Fantastic yep. movie. I love that movie. Murder, hey. death, kill. He when you, he when you said he KDs people, I, I'm thinking M, M, murder, death, you know kill. You know what's funny? I just use the seashells. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he doesn't know how to use the three seashells. <laughs> but all right, man. So that ends the card, right? Yeah. Um, you know, we, we for the most part of the main card, we were pretty similar. For most of the uh, undercard, we were opposite. Yeah, I mean, uh, this one's going to be fun because it's not going to be bonus points that separate us. Yeah. And and it, and it could be though because it could be that our cards are so differently or are so different that I could win half of my fights and you're half wrong. And then yeah, I can win you half know? of mine. And I'm half wrong. Yeah. You know, so it could potentially put us in a situation where we're where still Where the close. bonus points need to come um, to play. It's going to be fun to watch how it plays out, but you know what? Ultimately though, we need more of you guys to come out there, sign up and join us in our group. I think we're at 19 people 19 right people now so far. 19 people signed up. 19 people signed up. We want more. We want to have that big, the biggest group on Tapology. That'd be you dope. Um, and if you win, if you win, you get to get you get the opportunity to be announced. Yeah, we're gonna shout you out on the podcast. You'll know, we'll shout you out at the end of the podcast. Overall, that's our fight picks for Derek Lewis versus Alexi Olenek, a UFC fight night in Las Vegas at the Apex Center. Yeah, man. Hey, let's crush you ready these to crush cans. Those cans?